The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho. Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Remember what that means. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. So grace is getting what you don't deserve, but mercy, it's not getting what you deserve. Have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. What do weddings, funerals, bees, and rats have in common? Well, they're all here at St. John's. We had a wedding yesterday. We had a funeral the day before and the day before that. Marion Motes, Marvin Bridingham, three in eight months for the Bridingham family, three deaths in eight months. But we have bees up in the attic, and we have rats, colony of rats in properties beside us. Do we know our neighbors? I don't love them. (laughs) But they are comical. They climb trees. They hang off of branches. They chase each other. They nurse to see the big, fat mother rat dragging along the children. Oh, for a high-powered pellet gun. Not in town, but the exterminators were here. I think we had three. So hopefully that'll be solved before the winter cold sets in and they decide to take up residence. There are are always more things going on here than what your eyes might see. There have been and always will be For those who have eyes to see, great things happening for the sake of Jesus Christ. And Jesus does a wonderful thing in this 10th chapter of Mark by reminding us in such a simple way how even the blind have senses to be made aware that in the presence of Jesus, Miracles can happen. Miracles do happen. But that understanding, that willingness to believe, takes us beyond ourself. So as long as our focus is on that which we see in a mirror, I suspect we won't see, and we will be much like Bartimaeus, the blind beggar. Remember the story not too long ago before this one was when the rich young man approached Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit the eternal, to inherit eternity? And Jesus said, I think most appropriately, reminded him 
that he had to let go of his own self-dependence. He had to let go of every crutch he was holding on to. And in this particular situation, it was his wealth. Let go of your wealth. And Jesus reminded him that to be united with others for solidarity, if you will, give it to the poor. So I want to say this again, and I want to be clear about why and how I'm saying it. When I came to you seven years ago, and this is critical, and I continue to remind you as frequently as I can, because I want you to become comfortable with your history. You are comfortable with your history in almost every area, except it seems when I speak with you, and then it seems as though you receive it as an indictment. So be it. But I want you to be comfortable that seven years ago, I was told that I came here to be your teacher and that you wanted to grow and that you wanted to deepen your relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm sure that most of you did not know the consequence of that request because I would take you seriously. I'm an older man now. I was a younger man then, and I take the mission that God gives to me very seriously, and I will do what it takes to accomplish that. So we had to move things out of the way. We had to clean out a building. We had to clean up record keeping. We had to know who we are and just knowing our roster of who are we supposed to call. We had to have accurate phone numbers. And I could go on and on, and seriously, I could go on and on, and it's incredibly embarrassing. But to get to the point of where we are now, and I suspect there isn't a person in the pews now that isn't hungry for why I came here. You may not be hungry for me, and especially after I've kicked your butts for seven years. I've told you that your ego was way too big and that you weren't nearly the church you thought. I told you that your programming did virtually nothing to help and save the future of the church. And I told you, worst of all, that it's going to be a hard day journey to get to where you want to really be. And those of you who have ears to hear and eyes to see know that the cost has been worthwhile because you are moving forward. But I haven't heard anyone cry out, mercy. I haven't heard anyone cry out and say, we must get beyond our desires to God's desire. I haven't heard much of that, but I'm asking for it. And yes, you will recruit yourselves to the population that will be ones who want to learn. And your small group ministry will go from 35 to 350 if you allow it. If you really hunger and want to know the God of Scripture, then it will take work, but it's worthwhile work. If you want to just be where you've been, well, I'm, you know that I'm not your guy because I'm a teacher and I'll never satisfy for allowing you to be in second grade for the remainder of your lives. But you are the audience that want to move forward, right? You're the ones that want to learn, correct? You're the ones that want to have an impact in this community and beyond. And it starts with knowing our neighbors. So we have to get out of our pews and we have to walk door to door and simply, not because we want them to come to church, of course we would welcome them in the building, but we want them to come and participate in a vibrant ministry. I had the opportunity last night, the privilege, the only other, the only other congregation directly represented in Division I, group number 24, was Morningstar, because Morningstar, Stephanie Landis, one of their leaders, and their lead pastor, their senior pastor, Chad, was with us in that parade. And I was so proud to meet the leader of Morningstar. And I was so blessed to hear his message that they have now integrated with purpose the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed. Now understand, there are evangelicals in our world that say you don't need those things. You just need to have a high-flying spirit and man, play good music, and that spirit that you feel is the work of the Holy Spirit, and if that's what you think the Holy Spirit is, boy, do I want to invite you into an entirely different relationship with God, the person of the Holy Spirit. I want to introduce you to the Holy Spirit, 
that sanctifies. And it's not just pep rallies. It's about understanding how to clean yourself up by the help of God and only through the help of God. And that's what this gospel lesson's about. Only by God's grace, only by God's mercy, can you be who you like to be if you want to be a follower of Christ. Because it always ends up right there, doesn't it? Every one of these stories in Mark ends up, follow me. The rich young man, do this, do this, and follow me. Bartimaeus, your sight has been restored. Follow me. Because when you have eyes to see, you can't help but follow Jesus. When you have ears to hear, you cannot stop following Jesus. When your heart is transformed and renewed, when the shell of tradition cracks open and something else comes pouring out. So Pastor Chad, thank you for being a brother in Christ and leading Morningstar into a more liturgically based, theologically sound, core convicted congregation. Because we do this work together. It's not Morning Star over here, St. John's here, Good Shepherd over here. Those days didn't help Boyertown. What will help Boyertown is when we all stand together. You can't defeat hate by just saying this is no place for hate. You have to defeat hate by saying we are a place for love. Uniting a group of people against a common enemy is the elementary school way of gathering a group of people. Grown-ups gather people because they're for something. I stand for the flag and what it represents. I stand for freedom and patriotism and courage and the heroes that put their lives on the edge Bartimaeus put his life on the edge, literally, off to the street side, in the dirty, cluttered, trash gutter, blind, only able to hear the conversations as they would come toward him. And one day, the best day of his life, he heard something of Jesus of Nazareth coming his way, and nothing was going to stop him. Even the leaders in this passage, do you see when he cried out, Jesus, have mercy on me. Ooh, shut that guy up. Because you know what it meant to be blind, right? You know what it meant to be damaged, crippled. It meant that you were being punished for sin. How ludicrous could it be? And here Jesus is, he hears the cry and tells the people, the religious, the rich, the proper, the, the, the politicians, if you will, he told them, let him come to me. Who do I want pouring into my office and into these pews? I want people that cry out, Lord, have mercy on me. I want people in the pews because God wants people in the pews to recognize your status before God. I know y'all want to hear, you're saints, you're wonderful, everything is wonderful. That joy-filled discipleship is just the kind of stuff you want to put on fields this time of the year in hopes that it will grow a crop in the spring. You get my picture? Yeah. So what do weddings, funerals, bees, and rats have in common? They're all about the creation of God, all sent here for purpose. Even the rats know how to gather and feed one another. Even the rats know how to take one who doesn't know where food is and lead them to it. If the rats know where the food is and lead the colony toward the food, shouldn't the people of God, if we know God as our savior, shouldn't we be crawling out into the streets, scurrying like the rats to say to everyone in this community and beyond, this is the place where you find food. This is the place where you find living water. This is where you find salvation. This is where you find deepening in faith. Shouldn't every Christian congregation, shouldn't every card-carrying believer be out there saying, come this way, come and learn, come and grow? That's why what I have to offer you today is what I had to offer you seven years ago. 
and it will always be the same. The mess is cleaned up to as good as we can get it right now. Now what I want to do is I want to teach. I have to teach. And if not you, it's going to be someone else. And if not me, it's going to be someone else. Because you've got to be taught. And you've got to go back to the very beginning and know the basics. You have to understand it in your deepest reservoirs, your bones and your soul, that we are to cry out for mercy, that we are to celebrate our life in Christ. And because Jesus loves us, we should stop at nothing to love others. We should know our neighbors and we should help set them free from blindness, deafness, and an inability to spiritually live lives of abundance, joy. I see that in the servant hearts of those who catered and took care of the folks at the luncheon the other day for Marion Moats' funeral. I see servant hearts in those people. They want to do the right thing. They want to do good. And it is good to feed others. It's even better when you feed them and you keep telling them about the God that draws you to this place so that St. John's Social Club will never be known as that. But St. John's Lutheran Church will be our name. We didn't hand out enough cards last night. We only have 500, and we could have handed out three times that because we had a little monster of a kid running around, a little nine-year-old was handing these cards out to everybody they can find. And we have big ones, too. We had some adults doing that. We have Mike and Shannon, and we had Nyla. But this little Anna, right, Mike? Oh, my gosh. Fearless. And Miles, you work with her, right, in sports, in, in Taekwondo. You know that little aggressive heart. She's beautiful. That kid, if that kid ever gets a hold of the gospel even more, you're going to see someone change the world. Let me just go back to, over this thing a little more critically. In the chapter where the rich man asked, how could he inherit eternal, eternal life? Jesus said, through dependence and solidarity. Dependence on God and unity with one another. Well, how close are you as a community of believers? However close you are now, how about within the next six months, we strive to be even closer how about within a year, we're even closer? How about within two years, we're even closer? How about we do everything we can to get in your hands small group opportunities so that you can learn? The book that I really want to teach is Romans. It is the book of doctrine. That might make you vomit, right? Oh my gosh, he's going to teach us this serious academic stuff. Of course. Don't you think it was academic when your parents taught you how to read and write? Don't you think it was academic when they were teaching you before you even got to school? Let's be the teaching institution in this community. Let's be a learning community for this community and beyond. And if our community won't come to this building to be taught, then let's go outside the community and let's bring them in from other places. Whatever it takes to do the gospel, my teacher, the blind man said, let me see again. And Jesus' response, your faith has made you well. So if I could, I would just simply ask you, where are you in your faith journey? How many of you would say, I'm convinced, I want to learn more, and I never want to be a part of a congregation that isn't totally sold out to be growing and learning more and more. And I don't mean go to church, punch your ticket, and 30 years later, you really don't know a whole lot more than you did 30 years ago. All you get is a reinforcing of what you learned 30 years ago. Because you've got to go beyond. How many of you still read and study almost every day something? If it's not the Bible, maybe even your hobby. How many of you are trying to learn every day? Yeah, ask Gene. Well, maybe don't ask Gene. <laughs> this is a setup. I can't be any place in the house, in any room in the house, without something to read. Cameron, you get that. Yeah, it's a little funny. But I love reading, and I love learning, and I love learning about different things. 
So in this text today, would you want to learn about poverty and how to work with those who are poor? In this text today, would you want to work with people who are blind? Are we a congregation equipped for those who are without earthly sight to come into this place? Are we prepared? Is there a Braille Bible ready to go here? Can you imagine a church with $14 million and we don't have a Braille Bible ready to hand to a person coming through the doors? Is it because we're not smart enough? We didn't think it through? Why do we not have these things? If a person comes through these doors and they are physically challenged, are we prepared for that? If they are emotionally challenged, are we prepared for that? Are you prepared to have people walk through the doors that are alcoholics, gamblers? Are you prepared to have people walk through the doors who are unfaithful to their spouse? Are you prepared to have people walk through the doors who don't identify as, I'm a guy? She is a woman, but someone identifies as, I am neither, I am non-binary. Are you prepared for two men to walk through the door? Are you prepared to have two women walk through the door? Or will you do what you've done for decades, just have them run the other direction? And you do know that's your story. I'm not joking. This is not Bob the bad guy telling you always the bad news. I can't help your pastors didn't tell you the truth, but I'm going to tell you the truth. You have people not come to confirmation ceremonies because they knew they wouldn't be welcome. Never let that be the witness of this congregation. Never let it be the witness of this congregation. At least not while I'm here, please. You do whatever you want after I'm gone. But now, we be this people. We be the people who love. And I'm so thankful you're in the pews. I wish I could get to the 500 that aren't in the pews. I wish I could get the 50% of our congregation that I can't reach through our electronic means. They don't have email, or we don't have it. But do you know how difficult that is? I know of no congregation, none in my region, that have that low number of people to be able to be reached. We've got to change it. We've got to figure out a way to get to our people. And we have to have far more parties here because that too is what Mark leads us to. You're going to hear this in a couple of weeks. Mark leads us through all these challenging statements to the need to have parties together and to get to know one another. Andy, I got to know you more because we were in a small group on Saturday night, Saturday at 6. I would have never gotten to know you had you been sitting in the pews on Sunday. You know that, right? And when I got to know Susan Saturday at 6, that was way better. That was kind of funny. No. If you don't meet in small groups, you'll never get to know one another. So how large was this group that we're talking about in this text? Something for you to go look up. Jim, if you had a question right now after hearing this, what's your question? You're a smart man, so I lead to you. How do we do it? That's a good question. Here's how you do it. Prayer, study of scripture, and holy conversation. If you commit to three years of prayer, study of scripture, and holy conversation, you will never be the same. And I'll be willing to put down, I'll tell you what, if you commit to three years and you do that, on the fourth year, I will not take a salary. You commit to three years of honest to goodness, prayer, study of scripture, and holy conversation. And on the fourth year, you will not pay my salary. I think the denomination requires you to pay my benefit package but you won't pay my salary. So I'll save you tens of thousands of dollars because I'd be thrilled to watch you make it over that mountaintop. But that's what it takes. So prayer, it means really seriously hunkering down and not just the perfunctorial stuff. Lord, thank you for being here and for making the food and yada dabba dabba, amen. I'm talking about praying and centering in and asking for people's needs to be met. There are huge needs in our town, in the school district of Boyertown, massive needs. We can have an impact in that. 
and we can work with others to get it done. Bible study, I read my Bible, and it's good to read your Bible, but it's different to read it and have to be able to teach someone else. That's called study. When you read it so that you might have to do something and share it with another person, that's called study. You commit to that. Don't pay me in fourth year. When it comes to holy conversation, that requires getting together and doing it together. Yeah, I'm on a little bit of a rant today, aren't I? You know why? Because I love my dad. My dad is the most common man I've ever met. And I have such a high regard for those who don't have because my dad didn't have. My dad's house that he grew up in wasn't as big as from the organ to the wall and from the side of the railing to that. He grew up in a tiny little home and their most basic meal of almost every day were scrambled eggs. He grew up in Pine Grove. So you may have an impression of me and all I am is my father's son. So as one beggar that cries out for mercy, I need to work with a congregation that understands that. Cry out for Jesus. And Jim, it'll never be the same. And the day that Phyllis buries you, she will not only bury the man that she's loved for all those years, but she'll bury a man who to the end of his days grew deeper and deeper in an intimate relationship with his Savior, Jesus. Enough.